One of the big what ifs in NBA history is Larry Johnson, the number one overall draft pick in 1991 out of UNLV. In just his third NBA season, he injured his back and was never the same explosive player from his first two and a half years in the league. Early in his career, Johnson was very Zion Williamson-esque. As like Zion, he was an undersized but physically broad power forward with a unique blend of strength, agility, body control, and explosiveness. Now Zion, I would say, is definitely even more explosive, is shiftier than Johnson was, changes direction on drives better than he did, has better handles, is a much better improviser with the ball, and adjusts his body better when he goes up to finish at the basket to go along with his power and spryness. But as you can see from these early LJ clips, there were commonalities between the two. Here you see Johnson's explosiveness on display. Let's not forget too that LJ participated in the 1992 slam dunk contest at All-Star Weekend in Orlando and came in second place behind Cedric Sabalos. Pre-injury, he could blow past most other power forwards and then be able to power his way toward the basket for strong finishes. He had a quick first step and used ball fakes well to evade defenders inside and score on reverses and up and unders. Also, although he was a righty, he went left a lot and showed great bursts going in that direction. Here you see that against Kevin McHale, Chris Gatling, Charles Oakley, Purvis Ellison, Patrick Ewing, although he does go to his right side here, and Lorenzo Williams. Playing under Alan Bristow in the early 90s, the Hornets played at an extremely fast pace and were great in the open floor. A healthy LJ was so mobile that he would always flourish in transition. Charlotte ranked number two in pace each of Johnson's first two NBA seasons. Sometimes Johnson would even handle the ball up the floor. Here you see examples of that. The Hornets occasionally would race ahead even after a made shot by the opponent. One of the interesting side notes about Johnson was that it was right after he had one of his most dazzling performances of his career that he aggravated his back. On December 27, 1993 against the Detroit Pistons, he recorded one of the most impressive triple doubles of the 90s with 29 points, 20 rebounds, and 11 assists. It was one of only two times throughout that decade that a player had a triple double with at least 25 points, 20 rebounds, and 10 assists. Chris Webber had the other one on November 23, 1999 against the New Jersey Nets. Johnson would go on to miss 31 games after that performance against Detroit, and over the next couple years, it became noticeable that he wasn't the same explosive, super athletic player from before. But what was also glaring was that he had really developed a more all-around game. In that time though, he and Alonzo Mourning struggled to coexist, and the Hornets had to split them up. First, Mourning was traded to the Heat in 1995, and then a year later, Johnson was dealt to the Knicks. Johnson was always very skilled in the post, and that continued with the Knicks. Even though he didn't pivot off defenders as well as he used to, he had excellent footwork, a lot of fancy fake shot moves down low, an outstanding spin move, and then a nice touch from either direction.
Often you'd see him step all the way across the lane and just kind of float it in. What he really added to his repertoire was a beautiful fallaway jumper from the post. He even incorporated an Akeem Olajuwon-esque dream shake to his offensive package, as you can see here. He just became more finesse oriented while enhancing his overall skills to make up for some of his lost elevation and mobility. He was good at splitting defenders too, when a second defender came down to help. The other big thing was the development of his jumper, all the way out to beyond the three-point line. Now he did come into the league with an ability to step out and shoot deeper shots, but following the initial back injury, he relied on his perimeter shooting much more. So in his first season with the Knicks in 96-97, 53.3% of his shot attempts came within three feet of the basket. So he was still doing a relatively big portion of his damage inside. But the very next season, only 46% of his shot attempts came from this short range. However, he wasn't very efficient on jumpers. For instance, from 12 to 18 feet out between 96 and 2001, he shot just 32% from this range on 475 attempts. During this time frame, there were 146 players who took at least 450 shots from this range. Johnson was one of only eight players from that list to shoot under 33% from there. When he came back from the back injury in 94 was when he really extended his range out to the three-point line. In his first three NBA seasons combined, he took just 113 three-pointers. Then in his fourth season alone, still with Charlotte at the time, he took 210 of them. For his career, he shot 33.2% from beyond the arc in the regular season on 1,104 attempts. Several of the clutch shots he made came from long distance. For example, he hit this big three-pointer to seal a win over the LA Lakers on March 24th, 1996. Here on April 10, 2000 against the Indiana Pacers, he drilled a go-ahead triple with 21 seconds left. Funny thing as you watch the clip is that Patrick Ewing thought this was an alley-oop to him. And then of course, one of the most memorable single plays in NBA history, LJ connected on a game-tying three-pointer while getting fouled by Antonio Davis with 5.7 seconds remaining in game three of the 1999 Eastern Conference Finals against the Pacers. 
Let's take a listen to the NBC broadcast as it was happening with Tom Hammond, Bill Walton, and Steve Snapper Jones on the call. Johnson would go on to make the go-ahead free throw, and New York would win the game, and ultimately the series in six games. Because of his jump shooting capability, defenders had to guard him in space, and with Johnson's excellent pump fake, he got defenders to bite quite a bit, and that enabled him to drive by them to the basket. Other things about LJ was that he had terrific hands. He'd catch just about anything thrown his way as these clips highlight off outlet passes. And he had a really high basketball IQ, which made him a very good facilitator. LJ got double teamed a lot in the post, and he made great reads to find teammates on the perimeter or cutting to the basket. Here are clips showing either him kicking the ball out to a shooter when the second defender came down to the post, and then ones where he found a teammate cutting to the basket. He also was good at throwing up lobs to teammates for alley-oop finishes. In all five of his seasons with the Hornets, he averaged over three assists and three times averaged over four dimes. Not many other power forwards averaged that many in those seasons. While never known for his defense, he was a smart defender. New York had a top six defensive rating in all of LJ's five seasons with the Knicks. They were number two in that category his first year there in 96-97. Johnson ended up playing just 10 NBA seasons because of his chronic back problems. All in all, he was a two-time NBA All-Star, was the Rookie of the Year in 1992, and made the All-NBA second team in 1993. Although he never played in the Olympics, LJ won a gold medal for Team USA in the 1994 FIBA World Cup in Canada. The most points he ever scored in a game was 44 against the Celtics on November 22, 1995, and the most rebounds he had was 23 against the Timberwolves on March 10, 1992. So that'll wrap up this video. If you like this kind of content, please subscribe.